Did you know that a series of truly disturbing mouse experiments conducted 60 years ago predicted America's modern dating disaster, our mental health epidemics, and the breakdown of our families? In fact, all of our social challenges, the modern dating issues, divorce epidemics, people abandoning their children, sex addictions, only fans, even drug addictions and mass shootings were all mapped out 60 years ago. I'm going to use these experiments and neurological data and lots of statistics I've pulled from around the world over the last 30 years to show why I believe that a social collapse is not coming. We've already experienced the collapse. In fact, I believe we are living in the rubble of a society right now. But I also believe the answer for how to create a better future for generations right now who are growing up comes from a proven theory that I have seen bring shattered families back together into loving, connected family systems. And I've seen it help individuals who live in total despair to reclaim their passion for life and full functionality. I am Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. I have 15 years of training and experience. First, as a licensed marriage and family therapist who worked extensively with at-risk families, with correctional clients, and with people at the top levels in high-level entrepreneur positions, executive positions, and trust fund families. I have worked with everybody across the entire spectrum. Now I work as an attachment specialist, showing people how to rebuild their life and their relationships using something called attachment theory, which brings secure, fulfilling, and sustainable relationships, even if you've never experienced that before. Now, this video is going to be a wild ride, but by the end of it, you are going to see exactly what's wrong with modern society and how I believe we are going to fix it. So let's get right into it. Now, my clinical supervisor, back when I was becoming a licensed psychotherapist, used to tell me that we have to understand a problem before we can build a solution. So let's talk about the problem. Number one, romance is struggling. Pew Research found that 63% of men, 24 and under, are single, but 34% of women are single. What? <laughs> 52% of the population is female, 48% of the population is male. How is over half of men single, but less than half of women are single? In fact, a lot of women are often unknowingly dating the same man. In fact, that might be why research from the University College London shows that 70% of relationships do not even survive the first year. Now, for those relationships that do survive here in the United States, 39% of first marriages and 50% of all marriages will experience divorce and an estimated two thirds of all marriages will experience some kind of affair during the life of that marriage. Now, divorce rates are actually decreasing. That's the good news, but it's actually bad news because it's only decreasing because the number of people who are even bothering to get married anymore is also decreasing. So romance, big trouble. What if you just choose to stay single? What if you just avoid romance, cut that part out, and let's forget that that exists? What if you stay single? Well, 65% of millennials, that's people aged 24 to 42, report feeling lonely every single day, with 35% of that group reporting feeling so lonely that they're experiencing crushing, severe depression because of that loneliness and isolation. Now, the research is split on how bad it is for Gen Z. For example, the Harvard Graduate School of Education study found that 29% of Gen Z struggles with depression, and about 36% of the people they interviewed struggled with anxiety. Now, according to the Pew Research Center, it's even worse. 70% of teen respondents there said that their friends have serious problems with anxiety and depression. Okay, but that's sad. People are stressed out. Romance isn't working does that mean that society has collapsed? Well, let's talk about these statistics. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration research that was conducted in 2021 revealed that nearly one in three adults in America had either a substance use disorder or a mental illness in the past year. One third are either addicted or have a disorder from stress and mental problems. That's pretty big, one third, okay? Now, according to the CDC, the number of people who died from drug overdoses in 2021 was over six times the number of people who died that way in 1999. So drugs, mental health problems, romance, all of that is collapsing. What about families? Let's try families, okay? Nearly half of all babies born in the US now are born to completely unmarried mothers. Is that a problem? I don't know. Let's talk about this next piece. The U.S. Census Bureau says that one in four children currently live without a father in the home at all. 
Is that a problem? Well, I don't know. Let's talk about this. A Michigan State University study recently found that 75% of examined adolescent murderers came from fatherless homes. Now, this includes mass murderers. Mass murderers make up a gigantic portion of that fatherless home issue. Almost impossible to find a mass murderer who had a father living in the home. Almost impossible. Now, are the kids doing okay? Apart from that, are the kids doing all right? As long as you don't murder anybody, what's going to happen? Well, 63% of what so-called self-deletions in youth, when you harm yourself to the end, you can't say this on YouTube, self-deletions in youth came from fatherless homes. This is according to the U.S. Department of Health, by the way, 63%. Statistics show that self-deletion is the top cause of death for young people between 15 and 24. And nearly 20% of all U.S. high school students say that they have thought about committing it. With 9%, 9% of U.S. high school students saying that they have made an active attempt to remove themselves from this world. What if I told you that one in 10 kids is, is trying to remove themselves from this world? Would you say that's a pretty healthy society? Try this out. Pediatricians have begun sounding the alarm in the last five years about self-deletion attempts among kids as young as 11 years old. They say they have never seen as many 11-year-old attempts as they have today. Does this sound like a functioning, healthy society? If that's happening at every level and society is unraveling this way, do you think that we're a healthy society or maybe we've collapsed? Well, this next piece, I think, puts the nail in the coffin. The biggest statistic that I believe summarizes all of them from four different studies conducted from 1999 up to 2010, they suggest that up to half of the population in America now has what we call an insecure attachment style. We'll talk about that in a minute. This has grown from 35% estimated back in the 1980s to the modern numbers of 50%. And indicators actually say it could be way worse in the younger generations today who are raised in modern society, especially Gen Z, perhaps up to 65% having attachment issues. Two thirds, how would you like two thirds of your population to have an insecure attachment? So what is insecure attachment? What does it mean? Let's look at those statistics for a minute and then explain exactly what this means to you. Because when I look at these statistics as an expert in the field, as a former psychotherapist, as an attachment specialist, this looks like a society plagued with misery and mental health problems, craving escape. This is a broken society. Now, the attachment issues in particular are a huge marker for me, and we need to pay attention to it, okay? This is why. Attachment theory was developed by British psychologist John Bowlby in the late 1950s and early 1960s. It was later expanded by Mary Ainsworth, who introduced the concept of attachment styles through her strange situation classifications. Basically, how you learn to get your needs met and stay safe as a kid, the skill set and mindset you learn as a small child grows with you into adulthood. Now, this theory posits that children are specific biologically predisposed to form attachments with their caregivers as a means of survival. But the way they form that connection determines everything. These attachments influence that child's emotional, social, cognitive development, everything. Modern research from several different groups in the last two decades backs up an idea that the ability for this attachment to get broken your ability to connect with caregivers who are inconsistent, who are hurtful, who are distracted, who are absent, that brokenness to then shift and connect to your world in a safer way that, per that pushes other people away and keeps you safe from them is a survival adaptation designed for an extreme environment where it's advantageous to assume nobody is ever going to love you or care about you. So you adapt, as we see about two thirds of Gen Z adapting and about half of all US adults in total. So why would we have this adaptation? Well, uh, let's imagine a thousand years, the Danes, who we call the Vikings, sailing up the coast, right? They burn your village to the ground. They kill everybody you care about. They kidnap you. They take you back to Denmark. And now you have nobody to support you. You have to survive alone among hostile strangers who are going to most likely hurt you. You won't be secure. You won't be happy. You're not going to be loved. You are going to beg for mercy and seek approval from other people or you're going to become hardened to survive in a ruthless environment where nobody cares for you and you have nobody to watch your back. This is attachment. This is why we developed it. And that is what all modern generations are showing here in America is signs of that level of dysfunction at the inability to connect with other human beings, an extreme survival environment. Yes, in modern day America. Now, why is this happening? 
through my research as an attachment specialist, what I've studied and found is that over the last hundred years, generations have been traumatized, wounded, and lost their ability to connect with others. Back in the early 1900s, families started shifting into cities to try to survive, to try to get jobs. But with World War I, we lost a whole generation of men in a meat grinder over in Europe. That lost generation was broken and tremendous problems plagued families after that, who then came home and had to try to survive through the Roaring Twenties, through all that fun and decadence, and then crash into the Great Depression, into the Dust Bowl, into losing your family farms, into being homeless and shoeless, shoved into cities, working 16, 18 hours a day. Did you know that before Ford came along and created the 40-hour work week, the average work week was anywhere from 80 to 100 hours a week, and you'd have to live in a one-bedroom one apartment for your entire family. Your family was broken. Extended family systems were broken. Most people had not traveled beyond 15 miles from their place of birth prior to that. Now they traveled states across to try to go to California and other urban areas where they could find work. This destroyed families. Then they had to turn around and fight World War II. The greatest generation and the silent generation went suffering into war and destroyed themselves again. The second meat grinder hit. And what was left was people who learned that suffering was the only way to give love to your family. And the baby boomers came along and about half of them got it, a lot of them did not. They felt misunderstood, unloved, uncared for, and instead they scattered to find self-fulfillment alone away from the man and everyone keeping them down. They went out and they're currently tripling the divorce rates in their 70s and 80s already by breaking up families because they never learned how to feel loved. They only learned trauma and survival techniques. That's where all that trauma and survival comes from is that decades and decades of destruction and then passed down through multiple generations. If you're watching this video and it seems like it would be easier to have somebody guide you through this, a mentor to show you exactly what to do step by step in applying everything you're learning here, you need to join the Attachment Circle Mentorship Program. I will work with you personally for an entire year in 100 plus group calls. Plus, you're going to get the support of a growth minded community of other individuals who will be companions on your journey, people you can trust, people you can work with, and people you can practice these skills with. If you want to join us, join the Attachment Circle mentorship program. There's a link below in the description. I'll see you in there. Now, the baby boomers had their first generation of kids, their first crop, the Generation X and Generation Y, who tried to grow up in a world that they were being prepped for that then was destroyed. Generation X, Generation Y have been silent and just trying to survive and figure out how the new world works. But baby boomers then went out and had a second crop of kids in their second marriage and said, I'm not going to make weak kids like my first marriage. I'll make kids just like me, tough and smart, and no one will ever, ever overcome them ever again because I'll teach them to be paranoid about other people and never trust anybody. This is why the millennials and the boomers hate each other because the millennials were taught never, ever, ever listen to anybody in authority, but you better listen to your parents or else just because they're your parents. The millennials and the boomers are at endless war. Now comes Generation Z, who has never seen a functioning family system, never seen an extended family system, never seen thriving communities, never seen honesty and integrity and a society that values honor and love and consistency. We now have a society that values individualism to the point of insanity. Generation Z has never seen a functioning society, and that's why they are growing up at that 65% estimated rate of severe attachment issues as if they were all kidnapped and controlled and killed by the Vikings. Guys, I don't think that the collapse that we're all expecting is coming. I don't think zombies are going to overtake us. I don't think society is going to collapse and decay, and we're all going to go back to living in caves. I think the collapse has already happened. We're just living on borrowed time because our technology and our systems keep things running for us. But society has collapsed as much as I think it's going to, at least in the near future. Now, I said at the beginning of this video that a lot of these issues were predicted with a series of disturbing mouse experiments. Let's talk about that because it's a whole new level. Back in the 1950s, the mouse utopia experiments, and particularly Universe 25 of the mouse utopia experiments, were conducted by American ethnologist John B. Calhoun. He provided a fascinating and disturbing glimpse into the population dynamics and behavioral consequences of a large 
population with unlimited resources and no external motivating factors. Now, Universe 25 of these experiments was a large enclosure with unlimited food and water and nesting materials, the total absence of predators, healthy populations of mice with no sickness in a gigantic, perfect enclosure just for them. But with limited space. Now the population initially grew rapidly, overwhelming everything, doubling every 55 days. However, after 315 days, the growth began to slow significantly as the population approached about 620 mice. Now the mouse population density increased and unusual social behavior started emerging. This was called a behavioral sink by Calhoun. This included aggression behaviors, withdrawal from society, failure to engage in any typical mouse activities like mating or rearing their children at all. The society of mice, in fact, began to break down. Those normal social roles disappeared completely. Males became either really aggressive or super passive and withdrawn. They failed to defend their territories. They wouldn't even mate. The females became very aggressive. Some started neglecting and abandoning their offspring, even attacking their own children for taking up space. Remember, they had unlimited resources, so they were not fighting over food. It was fighting over comfort and space. Now, a subset of mice emerged, and this is really disturbing, later called the beautiful ones. They isolated themselves from the rest of the group, kept themselves apart. They focused solely on self-grooming. They avoided all social interactions, including mating, no fighting, and it led to them appearing healthier and more beautiful. They were gorgeous, completely withdrawn, completely encroached and, and, and focused on their beauty. Now, some mice were pushed to the fringes of society and they started to exhibit increased aggression. They lashed out at their peers. These outcast mice would lose their place within social order completely. Then they'd go out and commit violent acts, not just for territory or mating, but out of stress or frustration, further contributing to social chaos and the decline of the population. This issue, they'd get pushed to the edge and then lash out and attack every mouse they could get until the other mice put them down. Mass killings. Now, despite having everything that they ever needed, an abundance of food, even quite a bit of decent space, as long as they didn't get too many mice in there, the population started to decline after reaching that peak. They eventually led to total extinction, death of every mouse in the experiment. This decline was not, again, due to resource issues, but the total collapse of social structures and roles. Now, you probably see some parallels here between the mice and our current society. If you go back and combine that with a hundred years of trauma and family breakdown first happening in the U.S. and then stack the mice utopia experiments on top of that, I believe this is our problem. And our neurochemistry proves it. Let's look really quick at the six brain chemicals that drive a lot of human bonding, health, and happiness. So there's six you need to know. First, cortisol. Cortisol is a gigantic stress hormone that floods your system when something feels uncomfortable, high friction, scary, dangerous. When you get stressed out, whew, cortisol hits your system. This is important to know for the next five brain chemicals. One brain chemical you absolutely have to learn about is called oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone released when we feel loved and safe. In fact, it's called the love hormone. In the absence of cortisol, we start to receive oxytocin. When mom hugs us, when someone gives us a kiss on the forehead when we're a baby, they hold us, they comfort us. If you ever wondered why mom kissing your boo-boos when you're little, if it makes them feel better and why... A lot of oxytocin. You feel loved and it actually suppresses the pain. One big thing that oxytocin helps do is release GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. Now, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that shuts down anxiety and depression. It's like a natural anti-anxiety and natural antidepressant that you can take every day when you feel loved. In fact, when you feel loved, it's your brain saying, I don't have to be scared. I'm protected and I'm loved. It shuts down the expression, the release of cortisol, the severity of cortisol, the length of cortisol release. So you are more resilient against stress because you feel so loved. GABA also happens to help you release melatonin so that you can sleep better at night. A lot of us have chronic anxiety nowadays and chronic insomnia as well. Have you noticed that? The third chemical you need to know about is the bonding hormone vasopressin. Now, vasopressin is enormously important for bonding, and it bonds you when you solve stress, solve cortisol together with somebody else. Now, this is based on the research of Dr. Sue Carter, who shows that in mammals, when they release vasopressin together while bonding and while solving a challenge, it creates a powerful positive association where they feel safe 
in the presence of that creature that helped them solve the problem. The more problems you solve, the healthier you get. What's fascinating on this is the research shows that couples who renew their vasopressin bonding actually stay together longer and experience renewed honeymoon phases. Two, three, four, five, six times more and more honeymoon periods because the vasopressin comes along and you love being with that person. So then you start initiating more affection and oxytocin bonding. Now, when you have oxytocin, What's cool is that you feel more affectionate toward others. There was a recent study that showed that when you spray oxytocin up the nose of fathers, they become instantly more affectionate with their newborn children. It's a fascinating piece of research. I encourage you to look it up. Next is serotonin. Serotonin is long-term mood stabilizer. This is what allows you to feel happy and content. In fact, real happiness is a combination of serotonin and oxytocin flooding through your system in the right levels. When you have serotonin, you feel happy. You feel very content. Now, a lot of people today are desperately scraping the bottom of the barrel to get their serotonin because they aren't getting it in their relationships. They're getting it through fitness, exercise, nutrition, maybe some fun activities, but they're scraping the barrel. They're not getting what they should be getting through their conversations, their connection, their relationship, their time together, all of those good moments. The last one is dopamine. We really need to know this one. Dopamine is a short-term reward piece that makes you feel good when you do something that feels good and it benefits you in some way. It's supposed to be a small signal that says, hey, that felt good. Let's remember that for the future. Dopamine is very important. It's very addictive, but it can burn out on the novelty of it if you don't keep resupplying it or increase and increase and increase. Now, serotonin doesn't work that way. None of these others work that way. They are not habit forming, they're not addictive, and you don't wear out these other receptors, but with dopamine you can. Now, when you have attachment issues, when you're not connecting to other people correctly, it's hard to get that openness and that connection because your, your cortisol actually shuts down your bonding and you stay away from people because being open and vulnerable feels scary. When you don't get oxytocin, you also don't get much GABA. So you're more likely to be stressed out, miserable, and alone. Remember all of those research statistics we talked about young, about, about younger generations with anxiety and depression issues. You also don't get much vasopressin because you're not solving problems with other people. So you're not going to feel safe. And you also won't get much serotonin because you're not having good conversations, openness, connection, joy, happiness with people. What you do get, dopamine. And that's why dopamine in particular has become a major addictive issue in modern times. Cell phone apps, for example, and social media platforms run on dopamine inducing systems. For example, did you know that Instagram's notification algorithms, they typically like to withhold all those likes that you're supposed to get to deliver them in large bursts later on. So when you make your post at first, you're like, man, nobody's liking my comment. I don't get it. And you get disappointed. And then all of a sudden a flood comes in later on, you go, oh, whoa, and your dopamine centers are primed for that slush, that overflow. And then you go, whoa, I want to check again. I want to check again. I want to check again. Dopamine activities aren't just Instagram. It's not Instagram alone. It's pornography, video games, sugar consumption, binge shopping, swiping endlessly on apps for stimulation, Tinder apps, all kinds of things that are instant gratification, dopamine, 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 dopamine. If you look around at our modern culture, it's an endless flood of dopamine activities. Now, even if you don't reach technical addiction levels on any one of these activities, you may not have pornography addiction, only about 10 to 11% of people typically do. You may not have video game addiction, only about 3% of people tend to meet that. You may not necessarily have a sugar addiction or a shopping addiction. But think about this, all those dopamine binges across all those different things that you're doing, dopamine, 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 dopamine. Well, I want some dopamine. Well, I'll have a donut. Well, I'm still really bored. Well, I'll have some Mountain Dew. Well, I'll look at pornography. Well, I'm going to play a video game. Well, I'm going to go on Amazon. Well, I'm going to swipe on Tinder. Well, I'm going to go on Facebook for six hours. Dopamine, 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 dopamine. I hope that this is giving you a more complete picture of how we're spending our time today chasing this chemical. Now, research back in 2017 predicted that most Americans spend an average of four years of their life in what we call escapist entertainment. That could be swiping, it could be watching Netflix, could be anything, but that's 2017. That's seven years ago from this video that we're recording right now. That was before the pandemic, before lockdowns, before this increased wave of new ways to escape. And speaking of new ways to escape into dopamine, let's talk really quick about OnlyFans. The platform that combines the dopamine binges of porn with a pseudo girlfriend experience that can give followers those oxytocin and serotonin connections a bit from a woman pretending 
to be loving and nurturing to the customer during the sexual actions. Many OnlyFans creators talk very openly about the girlfriend experience being their most requested feature by their big customers. This is fake attachment as these men vicariously provide for a woman who then provides emotionally and sexually to them. This is fake attachment to replace all those chemicals we talked about that are missing from attachment issues. If your brain looks like this, you are endlessly craving anything that isn't this. So recap, what are we looking at? We are looking at a social collapse with a total breakdown of bonding and emotional connection. A purposeless life, as presented in the Mouse Utopia experiments. Deficient brain chemistry from both of those issues and an endless dopamine binge to cope. That's why we have the loneliness epidemic. That's why modern dating is a disaster. That's why the divorce epidemic is out of control. That's why people are abandoning their children. That's why there's sex addictions. That's why OnlyFans has become an overwhelming platform. That's why drug addictions are here and escapism. That's why Netflix is blowing up so big. That's why there's mass shootings. All of this ties back to the attachment issues, the mouse utopia experiments, and the brain chemistry. So guys, if society is this broken, if we are indeed living, as I believe, in a post-collapse culture, how do we fix this? We do what humans have always done when society fails us. When society collapses, I call this the Rome method that we start to rebuild with, and we begin to thrive and heal. Now, I call this the Rome Method from the famous Professor Mary Beard of the University of Cambridge. She's trustee of the British Museum, and she describes in her own work how Rome was founded by outcasts, likely those with severely broken attachment issues, who were rejected by the rest of society, but who banded together to form a new tiny village called Rome. Now, that village, you might know, grew into a place where these outcasts could rebuild in safety, could connect with each other, could share values, and could watch over each other to feel safe. They built all those brain chemicals back up again that we discussed, and they built new family structures so that they could survive together and build successful attachment. That's what made the Roman Empire as powerful as it was. As a person rebuilds those brain chemicals, and especially oxytocin, they begin to transform. Dr. Sue Carter, in her famous paper, The Oxytocin Vasopressin Pathway in the Context of Love and Fear, showed us clear evidence that introducing significant levels of oxytocin, that is building secure attachment and allowing the release of oxytocin in relationships, ends that lone wolf survival effect from broken attachment. And it helps an organism, in this case humans, to return to social and biological health. So, to rebuild society and to stop the social destruction happening in our youngest generations, remember 65%, we must use attachment theory to foster secure attachments for all individuals at every level of our society. Now, I've got a lot of ideas for this, so stay tuned, take some notes on this. Here's what I think we need to do. As the attachment specialist, 15 years of training and experience in psychology, every level of society I have worked with, this is what I see we must do. Number one, rigorous training on attachment theory for the public and how connecting with other humans drives our brain chemistry. Everybody needs to learn about this. Everybody needs to learn about all those brain chemicals and how we look like this instead of looking like this. If we can get that, I've seen my clients turn their lives around when they finally understand this instead of this. Okay? I think every school, every town hall, every church, every billboard on every freeway needs to be advertising this truth about brain chemistry and how humans need secure, loving, honest connection with those around them to be able to thrive. And that that is our number one need right now in the world. Now, it's great to understand attachment theory, but now we have to foster society where we can have secure attachments. Right now, everybody is afraid of everybody else. And we have a system in place called legalism. What can I get away with? That structure itself is a survival adaptation. I believe we need to come bring back the concept of honor into society instead of legalism and bring shame upon people who abuse the system in order to exploit other people. It should not be admirable to rob others just because the law allows you to do that. 
If you're watching this video and it seems like it would be easier to have somebody guide you through this, a mentor to show you exactly what to do step by step in applying everything you're learning here, you need to join the Attachment Circle Mentorship Program. I will work with you personally for an entire year in 100 plus group calls. Plus, you're going to get the support of a growth minded community of other individuals who will be companions on your journey, people you can trust, people you can work with, and people you can practice these skills with. If you want to join us, join the Attachment Circle mentorship program. There's a link below in the description. I'll see you in there. We need to focus on honor that individuals live with, including honesty, integrity, compassion, the ability to resolve conflicts with other people through reason and fairness. We need to make healthy behavior cool, perhaps through social media through social approval. How many movies and shows have you seen that glamorize the lone wolf survival mentality, the angry snark, and pushing everybody away? What if everything started moving back toward healthier stories, like they talked about long ago, all the sagas, all the great histories, encouraging you to be a healthier person and showing you that it was admirable to build those loving connections? What if we uplifted people who showed honor and reason and love and compassion? What if we celebrated those people instead of celebrating the opposite? I believe we could make a difference. In short, we need to create a society where people can trust each other instead of a collapsed society where people are terrified of each other. That's fostering broken attachment. And that's there's proven. That's proven, by the way. 65% of people are responding as if Vikings have burned our culture down and we're rebuilding in the rubble or they've been taken away as slaves. 65% of young people are adapting that way. We know that the collapse is here, you guys. So that's what we do, number one, to start fixing the society around us. Number two, we rebuild families. This is a crucial part for the generations who are coming next. They need social programs designed to foster healthy families that stay together instead of fatherless homes and children growing up in misery and dysfunction and abuse. This is a huge one, you guys. I can't even overstate this one. Right now, we reward couples for splitting up or never getting together, okay? We need to make couples stay together, but we need to make them healthier as they stay together. We need couples to get together and have the skills and the incentives to stay in a loving, fulfilling union because we need humans who are born into thriving family systems where healthy social communication and healthy conflict resolution is normal. They need to see men and women living peacefully and lovingly and resolving their issues in trustworthy, consistent ways so that those children don't grow up with extreme survival adaptations. So let me ask you, where right now are the rigorous training programs for parents and couples to learn to resolve conflicts with peace and love? Where are the schoolings on this? Where is the high school programs? Where's the college programs? Where's the free internet programs? Where's the programs on television blasting it out? Here's how to grow. Here's how to be healthy. Here's how to resolve conflicts. Where is that? Oh, we don't have that, but we need to. And until we have that, I don't think families are going to fix themselves because we have a hundred years of broken family systems. We need to incentivize as well families to stay more local to each other instead of fostering a system where families have to move multiple states away just to barely earn enough money to survive. If families can stay together, they do better. The research shows Dust Bowl, Great Depression tore families apart. Families did worse. Families were doing better before that. Not perfect. But when you have a thriving network of many extended family members, if your parents aren't perfect, your aunts and uncles, your grandparents, your cousins, everybody can step in and give you that love. And as you grow, you have a system around you to take care of you. You are not growing up among strangers who don't care if you live or die. Now, once we've rebuilt family systems, we need to work on resolving the loneliness of existing individuals. We're not just going to wait for everybody who's alive to die and then hopefully things get better in 100 years. Okay, individuals today need help terribly, as we showed in all the research before. We need social programs designed to get individuals reconnected with each other. Okay, number one, the COVID pandemic made loneliness and isolation so much worse. So we are right now headed in completely the wrong direction. We need to get people reconnected in their social environments. 
Fortunately, our ancestors have had to do this many, many times. What did our ancestors do? Number one, local festivals to celebrate anything. Hey, the fish are back. Hey, we really like this food. Hey, we grew this crop. Why do you think they had stupid celebrations? It was to foster this connection right here. We need to start having more stupid celebrations, more weird celebrations, more connections. A lot of people are connecting over co conventions of all kinds of stuff. We need to bring that to the local connection so that people are meeting each other again. Neighbors, villages, cities, towns, everything. They, people need to be reconnecting with each other. We need group holidays. We need connections where we are all bonded together in something that makes us closer as people. We need shared traditions. We need religious communities to actually have a purpose again and connect people in again. I'm not telling you what religion to follow, but religious communities are out there and they need to pull people back in in a good, loving way to foster community. We need more expanded family kith and kin networks. We need people reaching out to each other and building those bonds again, okay? And we also, perhaps need cohabiting for lonely individuals. Places where apartment buildings are built more in community so that people share. I have a very good friend who lives in a big apartment complex that has been built to be a thriving community instead of looking like a prison. There is ways for lonely people to band together. We could build a Tinder or a mate matchmaking service, but for lonely people who want a roommate. We could also restructure apartment buildings as we build them so that they do foster more of a community feel. We could actually support group areas for bar barbecuing, for sitting together, parks inside of the, the, the apartment building. We can foster spaces for people to gather. Right now, parks are broken and destroyed. A lot of times they're gathering places for gangs. But if we can take those places back and build them into the heart of the community again, people can bond. Now, here's a thought. You saw the stats on how lonely young people are. Crushingly lonely every single day. You know who else is lonely? Elderly people, abandoned, left to die. What if we linked up elders and young people? What if we gave young people who don't have anybody a mentor to speak to? What if we brought elders back into the fold of society and linked them up with young people in friendship and in pseudo family connections so that elders could transmit wisdom and have a purpose in their life? They could prevent loneliness for both groups. Both people could bond together. We have so many lonely people who are waiting for connection. Why aren't we fostering those connections? Why aren't our resources going in this direction to rebuild our crumbled society? And finally, I'm just going to call out the big screaming elephant in the room. Extreme political battles and factioning needs to stop demonizing the other side as inhuman, as subhumans for believing differently from you. This could definitely be a major contributing force to the stress that makes people believe we live in an extreme environment as adults, right? People every day are waiting for Civil War II to start. They're waiting for all that to start. It's endless hate and fear-mongering, race-baiting, political mashups where people are angry and screaming at each other and they don't even know why. If we could end the political extremism and get to a place where we can at least recognize that people are human beings, we might be able to turn this thing around and stop living like we are living in smoking rubble. So all of this comes down, you guys, to rebuilding healthy families so that new generations do not grow up feeling isolated and alienated. And we also need to tackle the isolation problems of current generations so that they feel fully reconnected and all of our brains can heal. Fostering that secure attachment, healing the brain chemical issues, building safety for all individuals. This is mandatory stuff for a barely functioning society, but we can rebuild from this collapse. And once our brains are working better, once our neurochemistry is balanced out, guys, we can tackle all those larger issues that were brought up by the mouse utopia experiments. Most of us are smarter than mice. I believe we could solve the problems that the mice couldn't overcome. We can address those issues of overcrowding, loss of meaning. Our better brains will help us solve these issues in smarter ways. I truly believe that that is possible, but it's only going to get better when we fix the attachment issues that are eating us alive. Now, I truly believe that this is our pathway forward as people. I've staked my life on it. Helping people build these solutions is my life's work, and I am here to make a difference. What I want right now, though, is to hear from you. 
Please drop it in the comments and tell me what you think about all of this. The mouse utopia experiments, the attachment issues, social collapse. Do you believe we're living in a post-collapse society like I do? Do you think it's already happened? Give me your honest thoughts. Give me your thoughts as well on all these solutions. Is there anything else that you think would help? Drop your ideas below. Let's start a conversation here. This is a conversation that we must have in order to start making a better world for everybody who lives in it. Thank you for sharing this time with me. I am Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. And one more time, I need to hear from you because I cannot do this alone. I want your voices down there in those comments. Let me know your thoughts. Let's go.